Hey guys, my name is Annie and welcome to my channel, 10 to Life, where I am bringing you full true crime cases in under 10 minutes. Full cases, start to finish, but only what you want to hear. None of the boring storylines or the empty plots, just the key facts, the most insane details, and all the unexpected stuff we know happens along the way. I'm coming to you directly from my apartment here in Brooklyn, New York, which if you're watching the video version of this on my YouTube channel, you can see beautiful New York behind me. And if you're listening to the podcast version of this, but you want to check out the video version, feel free to head over to my YouTube channel. If you guys like what you hear, please like, comment, share, review, and don't forget to subscribe by clicking that subscribe button below. If you have any case recommendations, send them my way. I would love to hear them. And don't forget to follow me on social at underscore Annie Elise. So let's get into the case. Hey guys, welcome back. So in today's case, we are going to be talking about the case of Taylor Williams. Taylor is a five-year-old little girl from Jacksonville, Florida. And on November 6th, 2019, Taylor was reported missing by her mom, Brianna Williams. Brianna is 27 years old and she's actually a first class petty officer in the Navy. I hope I'm saying that right. Super accomplished for her age, really impressive. On Wednesday, November 6th, 2019, Brianna contacted police and said that her daughter was missing. It was 7 a.m. and she said she woke up and didn't see Taylor anywhere in the house and the last time she had seen her, was midnight the night before. She also told police that the back door was open. Now Taylor and Brianna just moved into this house three days earlier, so it was essentially a brand new neighborhood. They didn't know anybody, so of course Brianna was very alarmed. An officer comes to the house to check everything out and identifies Taylor as missing. Shortly after, the media is alerted and an Amber Alert goes out. Police begin searching the Jacksonville home, and because they had just moved there three days earlier, they also decide it's probably a good idea if we go and search your old apartment, your old apartment complex, see if there's anything we can dig up over there. Their old apartment complex was only 16 miles away, so a new neighborhood, yes, but still a 20 minute drive, not super far away. So the search kicks off for little Taylor, and the very next day after the Amber Alert is issued and she's reported missing, three different sources tell news outlets that they hadn't seen Taylor in five weeks. And that's pretty alarming to hear that the very next day and through three different sources. Later that day, the police department holds a news conference and the sheriff speaks. The sheriff says that Taylor's mom, Brianna, is now no longer being cooperative with the investigation. To her about some inconsistencies in her statement, and that's when she chose to stop cooperating with us. And he asks anybody who has seen Taylor and Brianna together in the last six months to contact them right away. Three days later, on Sunday, November 10th, they decide to expand their search even further to Alabama, where Brianna and Taylor once lived, and where Brianna's parents and Taylor's grandparents still live. Next morning, on November 11th, just five days after Taylor was first reported missing, they officially announced Brianna as a person of interest and a suspect in the disappearance of Taylor. They continue to ask anybody who has seen them in the last six months to please contact them and give them a tip right away. And they also ask that if anybody has seen Brianna's vehicle, a black Honda Accord, going between Jacksonville and Alabama in the last two weeks to also contact them right away. When Brianna first learned that she was an official suspect in the investigation, she had a very odd reaction that was actually caught on camera through a dash cam. You know, now they're saying that you're a person of interest. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, open the door, open the door, open the door. I'm sorry, but you don't have that kind of reaction if you're not guilty of something. As this Amber Alert is issued on the news and all of this attention is coming onto this case, a neighbor of Taylor and Brianna's at their old apartment complex actually reaches out to authorities to give some information. And he tells detectives that he saw Taylor wandering around the apartment complex on her own alone several times. He says he first noticed this on April 17th, 2019, which was six and a half months prior to her being reported missing. He says he was out on his balcony talking on the phone around 8 a.m. and he sees little Taylor walking around in her pajamas. And coincidentally, these pajamas were the exact pajamas she was wearing on the Amber Alert that was issued. He approaches her, very concerned, and says, you know, what are you doing, sweetie? What's going on? And she says, I'm looking for my mama. Heartbreaking. He walked her back to her apartment. Brianna wasn't home, and he describes the apartment as being in complete disarray. He says there was clutter everywhere. There were boxes stacked. It was super dirty and filthy. There were trash bags piled on top of each other. Just not a great living environment. So he locks the door to make sure that she's securely in the apartment and leaves. He goes on to say that he continued to see Taylor by herself at least every other day, wearing the exact same pajamas and carrying around her little doll. And he says every time he saw her, he would look for Brianna's car or if she was home and she was never there. So why was this five-year-old little girl wandering around this apartment complex completely on her own in the same pajamas, holding her little dolly, 
Well, her mom is nowhere to be found. He finishes up his interview with detectives by saying he hasn't seen Taylor since May 21st, 2019. And that when he saw her on that day, she was with Brianna. He says he hasn't seen her since then, and he would ask Brianna, oh, you know, where's Taylor? What's Taylor up to? And Brianna told him that she was in Alabama with her grandparents. Now please ask Brianna about Taylor's whereabouts leading up to when she was reported missing. Where was she? What was your routine? What was she doing? Let's see if we can pinpoint some sort of timeline or gain any solid lead. She tells detectives that she drove up to Alabama on October 31st, 2019 to pick up Taylor from her mother's house, Taylor's grandparents, and brought her back to Jacksonville and that they had been watching her the entire month of October. So she picks her up and then brings her back to Jacksonville, which she didn't really think this through because of course detectives are going to reach out to her mother to corroborate her story and her mom says that she hasn't seen Taylor since January 2019. And both grandparents say, actually, we haven't seen her in over a year. Then detectives go back to Brianna and say, okay, so what was the childcare situation? Where was she? And she tells them that she's been going to the daycare at the facility on base for her work. But records reveal that the last time Taylor was at that daycare on base was April 29th, 2019. So at this point, Brianna has given numerous false statements to the police about Taylor's whereabouts prior to when she was reported missing. Investigators now decide, okay, we need to look at her GPS. We need to track her movement. We need to see what the hell was going on. And the GPS data actually leads them to a wooded area in Alabama. On Tuesday, November 12th, less than a week since Taylor was first reported missing, police announced that they have found Taylor's remains in that wooded area buried in a shallow grave. And they say her remains had a very advanced level of decomposition, meaning she has been there for quite some time. In that same wooded area, investigators find three different kinds of rope, a knife, pieces of plastic, pieces of fabric, a shower curtain, black plastic bags, blue gloves, cardboard, wire, paper, and a punch drink can. So at this point, they obviously know something shady and it's time to go pick up Brianna. On their way to arrest Brianna, she attempted suicide. She was found unconscious from an apparent overdose and was transported from base, she was at work, to the local hospital. On Thursday, November 21st, she was transported out of the hospital to jail to face two counts of child neglect. So for the next few months, she remains in jail and the investigation continues. And we really don't pick back up until January. On Wednesday, January 8th, Brianna appeared in front of a judge for the very first time and she pled not guilty to the neglect charges and for lying to police. That same month, a witness reached out to detectives with some pretty interesting information. She tells them she received a text from Brianna four months before Taylor disappeared, saying that Taylor had turned into a nightmare and how she would sneak food and leave it under her bed and was just all sorts of trouble out of nowhere. Okay, well, this girl is five years old. Cut her some slack, come on. She also says that Brianna would have men over so she could be wild and dangerous whatever the hell that means. And that sometimes she would stay out all night. And I'm guessing those were the same nights where the neighbor would see little Taylor wandering around the apartment complex in the morning asking for her mommy. Detectives then ask the witness, what do you think happened to Taylor? And her response is shocking. And she says she thinks Brianna locked her in a closet and starved her to death. A few weeks go by and on Wednesday, January 29th, that same month, the state's attorney office releases the discovery. And this discovery list is unreal. I mean, they're usually pretty long because it has to include everything that you're planning to bring up in the case. However, this had thousands and thousands of pieces of evidence listed. So rather than go through this entire laundry list of evidence, because we know we don't have the time for that, I'm gonna highlight the key pieces they found and some of the most shocking pieces of evidence. When they were doing the search on her new home that she had just moved into, they recovered a rifle, a shotgun, and a handgun. When they searched her previous apartment in the south side, they found empty shell casings for those guns, blood stains in six different locations of the apartment, and several kids' items in the dumpster. In addition to the blood stains in the apartment, they found soiled children's clothes, fecal matter, which is poop, cans of soup with small openings in them, which they didn't know what that meant at the time, and a very strong sense of decay. And like the neighbor said earlier, her apartment was truly disgusting. There was trash everywhere, there was stuff piled, there was mold on the ground, there were all sorts of disgusting things, and just tons of clutter and just filthy. Police say that that same scent of decay was also found in Brianna's car. And her car was filthy as well. We know she's not a clean kind of person. However, her trunk was spotless and it reeked of cleaning solution. When they were going through the inside of the car, which was equally as disgusting as her apartment, they found dead maggots, soiled clothes, fecal matter, which is poop again, and assorted sex toys super weird. Another piece of evidence is her cell phone records because we know that always plays a key role in any investigation. And the cell phone records show she made three trips back and forth from Jacksonville to Alabama on October 31st, November 1st, and November 2nd. After all of these back and forth trips, it shows that she returns to Jacksonville November 3rd at about 5.28 a.m. Then six hours later, she posts an ad on Craigslist looking for somebody to help her move out of her old apartment into her new place. And remember, this is three days before Taylor's reported missing. Detectives speak to the couple who helped her move and they say that they were in the apartment 
for over an hour, but that they never saw Taylor. And that even when they got to the new home, when they moved all the stuff over, they still didn't see Taylor. They said they did hear running water and that Brianna said Taylor was taking a bath. But here's what's weird. They say while they never saw Taylor at either place, they did load up a pink toddler bed and they moved that from her old apartment to her new place, which that's probably to make her new place look as though Taylor lived there, which in fact, she probably never did. But when she reported her missing, if police show up at the house and she has no children furniture or her daughter doesn't have a bed or whatever it is, of course that's gonna raise a red flag. So that was a calculated move to make it look like Taylor actually lived there when in fact she never did. And then two days later, she reports her five-year-old daughter missing. So now that the detectives have gathered all of this evidence, this huge laundry list of thousands of pieces, they come up with their conclusion as to what happened to Taylor. And their documents suggest that Taylor was tortured, maliciously punished and caged, kept in a closet for extended periods of time and fed soup cans with little holes drilled out in the top, which those are the soup cans they had found on scene. And they believe Taylor was killed sometime between the last time she was seen in April, 2019 or November when she was reported missing. But remember, because her remains were so decomposed at that point, the chances are this did happen much earlier than November. And one of the key pieces of evidence that supports this theory that she was locked in a closet and fed these soup cans is because when they were doing that search of the apartment, they found the soup cans in the closet and they found that the carpet was soaked in urine and fecal matter. Forced to stay inside the closets of their apartment and was left cans of soup to eat, the new documents show cans of soup were found with holes in the lids. Reports show feces and urine were found inside the closets, stains throughout the carpet in the apartment, and dozens of clothing items found in the apartment were either covered in stains or urine. It's just so tragic and horrific. How could anybody lock their child in a closet or a cage or a cabinet like the Gabriel Fernandez case, which is so freaking horrific? It's just so cruel on a different level, and as a parent, it is vile and inhumane. After all of this comes to life, Brianna's charges, which were originally just for neglect and lying to police, are upgraded, rightfully so, to three felony counts. And those charges include aggravated child abuse and tampering with evidence because police believe that Brianna dumped Taylor's remains in Alabama before she even reported her as missing. On April 7th, 2020, just a couple months ago, she pleads not guilty. I mean, the nerve of this woman. And because the autopsy results and the cause of death haven't been released, she hasn't formally been charged with anything directly attached to the murder of Taylor, which I'm thinking that the detectives and the prosecutor just want to hang on to that information for a little bit as they build their case and those charges will come 100%. Brianna's still in jail and she's being held on over a million dollar bond and she's due back in court on June 30th, which is literally in what? four days. If convicted, which, hello, she will be convicted. We all know that. She's going to be processed out of the Navy immediately. So I can't wait for June 30th because I am all over this case now and I want to make sure that there's justice for poor little Taylor. So as soon as there's more information released, I'll keep you guys updated. I'll let you know what's going on and hopefully Taylor gets the justice she deserves and Brianna goes to jail for life or worse. If you guys enjoyed listening to this case, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. And until next time, thanks guys!